Go through the front door, son. They don't like you, they'll throw you back out. <laughs> Bloody obvious, isn't it? In life, you work from the unknown to the known. That was the most terrifying thing in my life. How are you going to educate these kids that you've got that need sign language? When I went to Leicester, I didn't understand the mess a club could be in. I should have stayed. Any one of us would have died to help him if we knew he was in trouble, but we didn't know. I said, well, I thought you were a man of your word. I wouldn't have signed that. I said, well, I did, and I trusted you, and now I'm not sure I can work with you. Welcome everybody back to the process. For those of you who are subscribed to the channel and know about me and my feelings on people, uh, the best way I can describe it is that my wife said that when you said that you would uh, do the process, chat about the process, um, she said, oh my God, he's your Beyonce. <laughs> so you're my Beyonce. <laughs> uh, oh, first dear, question, dear. probably weren't expecting that. How does, how does that make you feel that you're someone's Beyonce? Wow. Um... To be fair, I just thought of ass then, because she got a big backside on her, hasn't she? So I'm your ass. No, I'm not. No, no. no I, listen, I, it's amazing what how other people think. You know, uh, it's amazing what you get. Some good things, you get some bad things. It's probably one of the nicest things anyone <laughs> ever said. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. I'm, I'm pleased that you do. Um, so. Uh, just to say, the, the sort of full podcast of this and the other episodes of the process, uh, there's a link in the description. Uh, me and my dad, who's uh, in the room, I don't know if you probably can't see him right now. Mm. My dad is here, and we spoke about what we kind of wanted to get from chatting uh, with you today. Um, so if you want to hear that, then go listen to the podcast. Uh, the place I have to start, the one time that we've met, I've shaken your hand once. Right. Can you remember the date? 28th of April, 2001. Can you, can you remember that? Don't worry if you don't. I'm not expecting you to remember it in any way, shape or form. Uh, off the top of my head, no, you no, caught me there. No man. worries. Um, so that was my 15th birthday. Right. But more importantly, I guess for you, more relevant for you, uh, QPR played Stockport County. You were manager. Right. And it was the season we went, uh, QPR went down to Division 2, as it was uh, then. Yeah. And, and it's the only time that we've met before today. Right. And so what happened was 3-0 to a team that had 10 men after 25 minutes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then Justin Cochrane got yeah. sent off. Yeah. And anyway, we ended up losing the game 3-0, already relegated. They stayed up. And obviously we've seen what's happened to Stockport County after that. And you went round, the, it was the last home game of the season. So mm. you went round and sort of, you know, if people were clapping you, you were shaking hands or whatever. And I sort of came down to the, to the front and I said, don't worry, Ollie, it's all right. And you stopped in your tracks and went and looked at me and went, no, it's not all right. It won't happen again. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that was a moment for me because I've, mm. so from 15, I've actually grown up with you because mm. you went to QPR 1991. Yeah. I became a QPR fan in 92, 93. So I knew you as a player. And then when I really got into watching them every week, me and Dad have had a season ticket for quite a while. But it started, a, our first proper season ticket was that year, right? The year after. The year after, yeah. The year after. Yeah. So I remember going back up and saying to Dad, going, he went, no, he went, no it's, not, uh, it's not all right. It won't happen again. Mm. And so now all these years on, um, I was trying to figure out why I like you as a person. Mm and why I defend you a lot of the time as someone who works in football media. And I think it's because, it hit me when I was driving home yesterday, it's because you always uh, step up. That was a phrase that just kind of came into my head when I was driving mm. home yesterday and I was trying to distill it. As a person, I feel like you are always happy to stick your hand up and step up into a challenge, into a situation. Mm. And so these interviews, when I talk about the process and things like that, often it's about how you get through different moments mm. and what you were thinking at that time. And then other people watch and listen to this, they can go, oh, okay, I've been in a similar kind of situation mm. and I can respect that or empathize with that. And I think that's what I, I'm excited to talk to you about and let people know more about you is your willingness without flinching to step up and take responsibility. 
And so mm. just carrying on that theme, and I've kind of spotted it a few times when I was sort of having a look at your career, but I'd love to start at that, uh, that moment then, yeah. because that was the end of that season. We went down into Division 2. Yeah. And I had thir 13 games you left had 13 when, games, I, when I took over yeah. from Jerry. Jerry was there the first three or four of them. Yeah. But what he, didn't do, what he wouldn't do is let me see how the club was run until the end of the season. Oh, really? He, his very words were, You'd be, you'll be angry. Wow. Because he knows what I'm all about um, through... But you took it anyway? Job, yeah, to just be fair, I didn't really have a choice, but all day long I'd, 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 have, got, I'd have done it for nothing because what QPR meant to me mm. through meeting Jerry, through meeting him at Bristol Rovers, um, the, way, the way he spoke about the club, I felt it was a part of me anyway. So it was a no-brainer, right. you know. But Even had, then? Yeah, you know, he had to convince Chris Wright that I was the right one. Right. Well, I had three interviews, yeah. and in the end, Jerry went, look, for Christ's sake, just give him the damn job, mm. you know? So we went down into Division 2, and for people who don't know what the context was, <coughs> what, when you were coming back, <laughs> that first, and this, were, this is going to be the theme, stepping up, when you come back into a job which mm. was stepping up already to a point, you've been at Bristol Rovers yeah. and done, done well there, but, uh, but you know, it's a, it's a bigger club. Um, you then walk in to pre-season, what is what do you find? What is the context that you that you have to kind of get well, on and deal did, with as a manager? I got to go back a little bit. You know, yeah. the minute we went down, the second we went down, I put some of the young lads that were going to be saving the club in that team, in that game. Yep. And right. we got trounced by ten men because mm. I believed they weren't good enough. Right? I didn't think they were ready. I didn't mm. think. And that Stockport County team stayed up by winning that game. Yeah, they it stayed up. It wasn't a good start. But they right. were in terrible trouble before that, yeah. and they managed to get out of it. But we went the other way. Um, and uh, the administrators came in. We were losing so, so much money. It was an impossible situation, but not for me. It was an impossible situation for Chris Wright, for the situation he was in. Mm. And with that... QPR and Wasps, it w wasn't a good business deal. It was terrible for him. So I knew all of that before I got the job. Right. So did I believe that I could do better than Jerry Francis and keep him up the rest of that season? No, I didn't. No. Really? I knew it would have to be a total clear out. And at the end of that season, I had to sit down. I chose to sit down and tell all the young lads who had five-year deals on astronomical money that you have to take 25% of what we owe you. And I sat down there with every single one of them. Well, and they're fine. walk away, right? We can only give you 25% of that deal. Right. But I think in the best interest for you is to go and find another club. No transfer fee, no nothing. You just get a sum of money to leave, tear up your contract now, and that'll leave QPR being able to trade. Right. I sat within every one of their parents and every boy and tried to talk him into taking that deal, otherwise we could have gone bust there and then. I wanted that responsibility. Right. I wanted to feel that. I wanted to, to live want through to that. that. I wanted to tell them the truth of how badly the club had made mistakes by giving them those contracts. And if it wasn't for that, I don't believe they would have took those deals. They would have forced, you know? So, because right. if you think your, if your dad felt that you had a five-year deal and you were going to be a yeah. player and you know and then all of a sudden you're only going to get five percent of that or 25 percent of that sorry mm. you probably wouldn't have took it but i actually and they all empathize with me because this club meant the world to me i was 29 when i came here and played thought it was all too late jerry did that for me and jerry loves this club <laughs> and, and i don't want to see it go down mm. because it's been badly run yeah right there was terrible 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 mistakes made in a in a time where the youth football was changing. If you didn't sign them on long deals, you could lose them. So that's what they committed to. And it was too much because mm. the first team couldn't cope with it. You know? So anyway, cut a long story short, I ended up, after the dust had settled, I got an administrator there telling me I, if I need to borrow soap, I had to explain why. Because we had no money to spend. Right, right. And I had to tell him that while I've only got seven fit players, two my best players are out injured for the whole next to the season, which yeah. is Clark Carlisle and Richard Langley. And I got no, <laughs> no goalie and no staff. Mm. 
But that didn't phase me at all. So it was seven players, right? So I had right? seven no players. No goalie. Now. No goalie. Yeah. And I had to sit down with it. Well, put one of them in goal. I said, well, that's, that, that, we got six aside then and we we're playing against. It was that serious. And I went, you don't understand. You can't treat this like another. This is what we do. We're administrators. I said, well, this is a football team and we need to play every week. So I need at least 25. What? I went, I need at least 25 players. I need another member of staff. I need to go away from home and, you know, you know you'll let, they'll all have to drive. They'll have to, uh, woo, 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 woo. It was a whole hold on and break on. Wait a minute. Let's deal with this. So it was a fight the whole time, but... Those first three days when you then understand all of that, is it just, uh, do you get home and just go, what do you do? Or do you just go, fuck? I was on the, I was on the phone trying to <coughs> get a group of people together, get a staff together to get going, because I know that's, that's what it is. You can only deal with it. Yeah. That's what it is. So you either face it, this is it. This is where I am, mm. what we're going to do. And really it was pretty bottom of a pit, wasn't it? But yeah we got to start to build a structure to get us out. Some of the names, some of those players. Unbelievable. I'm thinking, off the top of my Alex Benet, who's quite a tidy little centre midfielder. Mm. We had a mm. centre back, who I can't remember his name. I don't know if you can remember him. He was amazing. Benaziz, wasn't it? Benaziz was yeah. his name? He yeah. was cracking little football. We had Dudu. Yeah, Dudu, Dudu and Shitu. Five and five, yeah, yeah. little lad. Dudu and Shitu. We need all we needed son was Lou Rolls. We'd have had the lot, yeah. wouldn't we? <laughs> we, we, went to a, we went to a game and, and there was this Irish lad and he, all he would shout was, give it to the midget, give it to the midget. <laughs> <laughs> talk about this dude. Yeah. Like but yeah, we had some, but those were, but I talk about those players fondly because <coughs> I'd become a QPR fan in 1993, mm. finished mm. fifth. It was great. Mm. That's what football was, right? QPR yeah. do well. Slowly, year by year, it kind of like unraveled. Yeah. But that was a big learning point for me in terms of how I look at football and how I look at being a football fan because I've never been happier. I've never... And add in the play, playoff season win, mm. the championship winning uh, team. Those three years in Division 2, so much fun. And the reason there was so much, maybe not for you, as much for you, nah. but for oh, us oh, as fans... Oh, I wouldn't call it fun. Yeah, but for us as fans, mm. we were proud of our club again. Yeah. And you were a huge part of that. When you're a manager and you step into a job like mm. that, and first of all, it's like, it's damage limitation, isn't it? It's putting out fires. Mm. But then once you started to get a few building blocks there, was that something that you thought you could, you could really inject into QPR in terms of that, that, that pride of the club? Um, well, it was really, it was, it, that's the ultimate goal that you try and get all the time. Um, I think, if you look at management and what management's about, it's about making the people who are fortunate enough to wear that badge realise what it means to everybody. And that it's much, much bigger than you. You're just a custodian of it. And you better actually appreciate that. Mm. Otherwise, you ain't, you're not going to be successful here. Because this thing is bigger than all of us. And we got a, we're very fortunate to... And lucky to have it so you know you're trying to build that it doesn't always work because you know um, sometimes money gets in the way sometimes agents want their player to come to you but it's not about that it's about people you know and, and really deep down it, the football clubs belong to every supporter who commits their money to come in it's not the rich people who own it or the rich people who can make mistakes and I mean they're the threat really mm. They are the threat to our very survival. So, you know, being a Bristol Rovers fan like I was, the education that they gave me every single month, I was in every single minute of every single board meeting. At first, I hated it. Yeah. But I picked up feelings and knowledge of what was needed. I got the overall understanding of, yeah, we're Bristol Rovers. We haven't got a lot, but we're, we're almost maximising it. We were doing quite well with it, if you see what I mean. Yeah, Whereas yeah, yeah. I had the opposite of that. Without that grounding, I wouldn't have been able to do that and sit with the administrators and say, no, 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 you're getting this wrong. All those people who keep coming and they'll keep coming, you can't, they're assets. And in a minute, we've got no assets on the pitch, but we're going to build this back up. So mm. just shut up because you don't know what you're talking about when it comes to football. Right. Right? We, our crowd will keep coming. I'm sorry. It's like a cinema with the roof off. They'll keep coming. You can't move them 
to another cinema, it might be fixed and ready, but they won't go there. Yeah, yeah. This is our cave, and mm. that's what I meant. And I got that from, you know, we're not going to go and share with Wimbledon. We're not going to sell this ground. That's our own. No, 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 no. That ain't never going to work. Our fans are here. Mm. They'll keep coming back. So what we got to do is polish up the product. And at the minute, it's like rolling a turd in glitter, isn't it? You know, it ain't good, but I don't mm. care. Seven tiny little turds. Yeah, <laughs> seven tiny little turds. But what I'm saying, this place will take off again, right? And all we had to do was trying to attract in the end mm. the right owner who wanted to buy it because basically what it was was a fist that's flapping around and there was loads of sharks there waiting to eat up a London club. Yeah. You know, here we go. But really, I was on behalf of everybody who pays a little bit to So it sounds like you, pay their you understood the worth of that club better than... Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Every time Jerry Francis came into Bristol Rovers, what would he talk about? Who would he talk about? Why? Because he, in his way, he was trying to make us his QPR. Right. You know, because, and he was going back to how bowls he felt about QPR. You know what I mean? All his fellow players that he had playing with him at that time. Yeah. He would love them and talk about them and, and then go on about where well, they should have done it and they, they drew the last game. Oh, do you know what I mean? It was a, a, Are you crying? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because Jerry was a winner and he was a brilliant coach. And he was a fantastic person and he, he got one or two things wrong in his first managerial job. But with us at Rovers, he didn't. Right. We would, we would have smashed for a wall for him because we agreed with him. So when what I did came you agree in, with? I disagree with his principles that it's about you and it's about how good you, you can become right. and you can do this, yeah. but you've got to want it more than someone else. So that, that was all I was ever brought up with and that's where it came out. And I needed it more then to believe that this juggernaut, this huge lorry that I've got, got a couple of flat tires at the minute. Yeah. And that's how I saw it. So, you know, I'm not going to throw the old vehicle away and say it's rubbish and let us go somewhere else if I can fix it. And I just had to find like-minded people. First one was Kenny Jacket. First one was Kenny Jacket through a mate of mine, Gary Penrose. He said, Ken will come if you talk to him like you're talking to me. And I said, Ken, we might not get paid. We might do this. He said, when, when am I starting? And then what we did, we, we had local-ish people mm. who... Because I, I couldn't pay them to come, I couldn't pay. So I told them straight, got no signing on fees, got no this, got none of that. But what I will do, hopefully we'll be able to pay you each week. Because we've got the administrators running it, so you will get paid. <laughs> you know, but it wow. might be a fight. But it's a great club to play for. And help me rebuild it. Mm. So, you know, everybody we got, and I managed to get Mark Bircham, who's a yeah. mad, mad Rangers, for, for, yeah, Rangers fan, Kevin Gannon. You know, Lee Cook, yeah, who, right. who, do you know what I mean? So bit yeah, by yeah. bit, we got Steve Palmer, wonderful soldier, one of the best players in the world, but my God, you want him in the dressing room mm. when things got tough, proper man, you know? So, so in, terms of like, in terms of creating that feeling, I was watching this thing the other day about uh, Gary Neville saying, uh, he was chatting to Ian Wright about Arsenal, Man United, and mm. he said there were seasons where you just got that feeling at a certain moment, whenever it was, to go, hang on, we've got, I feel like we've got something here. You've had that at numerous different places. Mm. What what are the ingredients that create the feeling? Is that is that are you able to kind of no, it's, figure it's, out what that is? Are there what, elements? Yeah, there is. It's, it's when the people start caring more about their mate than they do themselves. And we had that when Clark Carlisle had some trouble. Mm. My players came and warned me. They told me that he might be doing. Can you help him? That's when it starts. That's when you know you got something going. Mm. And I guess and there's a trust there as well that like, yeah, they could yeah. have gone and tried to do that themselves, but they've come to you to, to, because they trust that you'll well, be able to deal with it. They did. Yeah. And they couldn't get the right... They were still sure he was doing something, but it wasn't until he had to admit it. So that's what they couldn't do. So was in that, the, in was the that end, a new experience for you to, oh, have to try and do it? Oh, the first time, and, and I hoped it was the last, but it wasn't yeah. where someone is in terrible turmoil. Um, two How did way, you tackle it? Two ways to be fit. Physically and mentally. Yeah. And the worst way of all is to not be fit is mentally. So he had some issues going on that he hid so so well, so cleverly, you wouldn't have known. Yeah. Unless you really, really looked. And then what I, um, I had to do because it was so serious, I had to get people who knew more than me. And, yeah. and that's what something I've always... 
never been scared to do is to admit, hang on, I don't know how to fix that, but I'll help, I'll, I'll help you get someone who can, you know, because that's what life's about, isn't it? Yeah. You know? I don't, well, I don't, it, it is, but it, I think uh, that was another, I always kind of drift towards words when I'm thinking about how, uh, who I'm mm. going to talk to. Another, another word I went to was, was ego for a manager. Mm. How, how do you look at that word and, and what, and the need for it as a manager because I think there's an element where you're you know you're the face of that <coughs> that club it's you mm. know you're going to take all the responsibility for what happens on the pitch but also you've got to get a group of people together so there's only so much it can be a dangerous thing as well mm. I would imagine what, what are your feelings on on ego yeah unfortunately we we probably all got one we all need one a little bit but you must when you come into a real situation you've got to leave it at the door you got to leave it at the door, particularly if you're in a situation where every, real situation mean club everything's club. gunning for you and the club's going to go to pot. And all I was concerned about was, you know, we might not win at the moment. We're building towards a way of doing this and getting back to it, but we're not going to go bust. Whatever we do, we're not going to go under because it's too big. It's too big a club for yeah. to not be here anymore. So, what you know, this is a huge part of that part of London's history. And... And I want to make sure that I'm, in my time, I'm going to try and help it, you know. So, and, and literally every one of those lads came for that reason. You know, they came for that reason. In the end, doing well, getting promoted again was an, a bonus. But it was, it was something that I wanted, it was something that we were, but it was a bonus. It was really putting it back, fixing it, putting it back. It was like a jigsaw that was bust in the box and... But I didn't know what a picture looked like, because that picture was wrong. Right. That ain't what QPR should have been. We shouldn't have stacks and stacks of young kids piled up there ready to come into the team. We can't afford that. You get a piece of cloth. You got to make that fit you. Don't make it, you know. Don't make it fit Lawrence Delalio and, and I try and wear it. it looks shit, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's got to fit you, and it's got to fit us. Yeah. And we should not try and be what we're not. And that's the biggest problem with QPR. Yeah. They end up, whoever takes over, a few times, they? wants it caught, to be yeah. like a mini Tottenham. Because if Tottenham were a chocolate bar, they'd all be licking themselves, wouldn't they? You know, that's how Tottenham are. We're not, we've always gone that. We're, we're a working men's club, in my opinion. That's what I saw us as. Yeah, I agree. That's what Jerry sold me. But they had flair. We were working men who wanted to do it, but also who were, had flair and who had skill. And that's why your bowses were revered quite rightly because mm. they were real you know and and some of the other clubs in london you don't get that feel you go into chelsea now you don't get that feel it's like corporate whereas yeah. we should have never gone that way so i tried to surround myself with people who i could convince that we were that big club but we're not going to act like them we're just going to get real right. biggest lesson ever peterborough away you're not famous anymore we got done four one all right. 4-1. Danny Chitu made his debut. Kenny, it's amazing you remember that. Kenny knew about him. Right, come in. He was almost crying in the dressing room after because he had he made a couple of mistakes. But don't worry about that, son. You'll do for me. You know, and that's the truth. We aren't famous anymore. So we got, and then we got the Vauxhall. Tr oh, what whatever it was. God, tell me about Vauxhall. Oh, Mertens. don't go there. Vauxhall. <laughs> so, I'll give Mertens. you the context, people, because uh, yeah, I can remember this. Could you ever get a worse scenario than that? You know, so we drew away from home against Vauxhall Motors in the first round of the one FA one, Cup. 1-1, wasn't it? We had a minute. off this road. And we went 1-0 up early on. And then we didn't. And then they equalised. <laughs> What's going on in your mind in the last half an hour of that game? You mean you're thinking about subs or basically the conclusion of the game when you get into the crux of it? I didn't expect, because you never do. But it happens, doesn't it? Yeah. There's penalties, wasn't it? Penalties, yeah, yeah. But those things can be good for you too, can't it? Well, it was because I, I had the taxi driver come in, giving me his pelters, and I got him in, sat him in my yeah, office. Yeah, I, I knew there was no more passionate Rangers fan, so he's absolutely giving me pelters. to come on in, let's sit down and have a cup of tea. So, yeah, yeah. literally two hours, we talked through it. I let him get get it off his chest, and I actually put his team on the board that he said I should have picked. And so I uh, showed him that. Why I didn't pick that team? Well, he's actually injured and he's actually and he's actually suspended. And you know, when when I was left, I said, "Well, pick from that." So he picked the team that I picked. 
That's a beautiful thing. And that's it. That's what I'm excited about. To, to no, he talk. picked the team that I picked. So I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. You've been hammering me just now. <laughs> but that's it. That's, and he went, that's it. That's he what... went, fair play to you. <laughs> right? But what I'm Neither saying, <laughs> what about me being right or wrong? Even if he'd have picked a different team to me. What I was, was I was, I was with him. Mm. Yeah? And I said, look, this ego thing we've all got going on, we've got to deal with it. We might be QPR, but we ain't the famous QPR that we used to be, so we've got to rebuild it. Yeah. And I need you to help me, because if, if I can only have this amount of money that I've got to deal with this, and I get these injuries and I can't bring anyone in, because they won't let me, what more can I do? Mm. Right? The truth is, we spend any more, they'll stop us, we'll go bust, that's it. You won't have this club anymore, so what do you want? So he's always been a friend of mine since, because, yeah, and he helped me with the other facets. You know, there was always, they were always fighting amongst each other. Right. QPR fans. Oh, anyway. oh God, yeah. Because they got two, I tried to unite them with, with some fans forums, because I felt that was in, really important. Yeah. When you don't know what's happening, you're going to worry, and you're going to get even more anxious. Yeah. So just tell them. Yeah. They all know you can't do that. Why not? And they couldn't do it, because they didn't want it out there how the club was because they want to try and sell it. I went, I don't care. I need these people to keep coming. Yeah, yeah. And if I can convince we'll all be all right and I get more of them coming, you're not going to argue with me then. I might be able to add it a bit more. I said, because this is killing me. Mm. Right? This is killing me. Because I need us to be able to together. compete. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So bit by bit, gradually by gradually, I managed to chip away at things, you know? You could tell from that squad though that the... And again, when you, when, you, when you came back recently, you saw different kinds of people. You could see yeah. their character yeah. as they were playing. They were, they were, they were hard-working people, and regardless of how good they were, because you know, the bottom line is, especially when you look at the championship now, the money that's in the championship, mm. QPR don't have that money. So yeah. you have to find other little elements that are going to help you get the win. Yeah, I, I think there was, a big, there was a big learning curve for all, for all of us, you know, when Paul Furlong came back to us and some of our fans started giving him some because he played for Chelsea. Yeah. Now to me that was ridiculous so I had to try and help him. You know, what helped was understanding why he was, oh I'm going to score because I, you know, I'm getting chances and I said, well you better score. Yeah, hurry up. Because I said I'm standing there offering the fight and <laughs> so anyway I got home thinking that ain't good. I said you better score, you know, come on. So I run Gary Penrose, I said, you better come up and help me with Paul. He said, all right. So anyway, he come up following day, sat down with Furs. I said, I want a penny to help you. He said, oh, Paul, Paul went, what, what do you mean? I said, well, he's an ex-striker. He just wants to talk to you. I said, we're going to go out and do something. We've got a goalie. We're going to, oh, all right. So anyway, there's just the goalkeeper, Furs, Penny and me. Mm -hmm. Penn said, I'm only going to practice what you're good at. What are you good at? He went, oh, missing. <laughs> so Penny went, all right. Anyway, we get outside. Got a goalie in goal and he, he puts two posts, like flag posts, one yard, well, one foot away from the goal post, but on the outside of it, not on the inside, on the yeah. outside. And he said, Ollie, you get out there. He said, I want you to head that or kick that, however it comes, attack the cross and put it in that gap there. Uh, outside of the post? Outside of the post. So first went, <laughs> what? He said, I told you, I'm going to get you to practice what you're good at, mm. right? And you told me you're good at f missing, so I want you to show me how good you are at missing, right? Maybe. He said, I'm only going to practice what you're good at. And this is a 30, I think he's like 33, 32 yeah. at this point. Full so anyway, he said, I'm told I would help Ollie, and I'm telling you, I only deal with positives. You told me positively you can miss. Show me how good you are at missing. So I crossed it, he missed <laughs> right in that gap. Right? He said, Ollie, there's only one, I only took one. Went the other side. So he said, cross it down that side. He said, I want you to hit that one now. And he's still laughing. And he pinged it straight in that gap. And then Penny went right. He said, all joking aside, your mind is focusing on missing. Mm -hmm. He said, and you're so good at it, tell yourself you're gonna score now. Wow. He said, he just- He caught fire, didn't he? He scored one in three ever since, from that moment to the end of his career, because Gary Penroy's made him see something that was in his mind. I played for two years, didn't score, still got patted on the back, well played, all well done. Whereas Penny said, yeah. you don't know what it's like being a footballer. 
you don't know what it's like to take have real pressure. You ain't got a clue. I missed for three games. I'm rubbish, yeah, yeah. right? So he knew what they were going through. I, you know, so I didn't want to criticise Furs. I wanted to try and help him, mm. and I realised I didn't have the skills to do it. Penny did by doing something so silly, and before you know it, he just refocused. But I also stood up for him against our fans. Let's go back to 1991 because stepping up again when you moved to QPR. As a player, you're going from Bristol Rovers to, yeah. to QPR where there's Ray Wilkins and was Roy Wegley there still? Or oh, yeah. Kind of yeah, they were there, yeah. Did you have the confidence to go, I can do this? Or, and if you didn't, what allowed you to have, not to miss, was it five games in, a, in five seasons or something? I think you, had, you played a lot of games for QPR. What allowed you... Well, I could you, show you what I used to do. I used to watch match of the day like that and think, I can do that. I can do that. I right. want to get there, I want to do that. I was 29 when Jerry yeah. saw that in me and basically he sat me down and said, I want you to come up here, I want you to train like you train just to show them how they should train. And if you don't get in the team, then don't blame me. But I, I want you here. So you did that before you'd signed? Yeah, he came up, showed me round, brought my wife up because we just had, our kids were all on the, on the horizon then yeah. and he was worried that we wouldn't move. Right. So he wanted to show Kim what I could be doing and, and he told me the truth that you might not get in if you look at the... But I want your attitude and your way to training to rub off on these lot. Right. But just be yourself. How'd that make you feel? <coughs> well, I was annoyed that he said I might not get in. Yeah. Right, to be Got honest. a decent right foot, actually, as well. Yeah, he, I was annoyed that he said I might not get in, but I understood what it was and um, there was no way I was going to say no, really. Did I believe I could do it? No, not really. I, I, I wanted to believe that I was good enough, but you never know. The group was a bit of a split group. There was, right. there was some really skillful lads who, you know, down that end, and there were some other lads from lower leagues who weren't quite like them. Yeah. Your Rufus Brevitts and, you know, I mean, me, I, me and, you know, and you had your Ray Wilkinses, your Clive Wilsons, and, you know, all of that down that end, your Roy right. Wegelys, and... But anyway, we, it all merged, it all worked, it all in the end. That's the thing in life, isn't it, as well? That there, there are moments where you, you take a job or you step into a new football team or whatever you do, and it's, a, it's the unknown a little bit. Yeah, but you sink or swim. Scared, you? No, yeah. you, you sink or swim, like yeah. everybody does, because we all, we all have a part of us that thinks, can I do that? Mm. Right? And what you've got to do is overcome that. Everybody feels that way, I believe, unless you're Ibrahimovic, because he looks like he actually totally thinks he's... The dog's padoobies, doesn't he? You know, so in but, terms of overcoming it then, are you like, when you're going into that, are you going, I'm going to double down on what I'm good at? Or, like, you just said you overcome it. You don't, you can't jump. I didn't overcome it. If, if Gary Penrose one brought back, I think I'd have had a nightmare. I was trying to do things that other ones could do instead of bring my game. Yeah. And um, Penny, Penny come, uh, I'm not sure, I'll have to look up about a month or two months after I did, and he's my best mate. And he was skillful, and I and he said, "Oh, he, what are you doing?" He said, "Jerry didn't sign you to try and do those turns and fall over and look shit." Sounds like he, he proper cuts through the shit, doesn't he? No, yeah, but he he actually when he brought you to be who you are, yeah, and you showed him that. He said, "You ain't got to do that turn." He said, "You're trying to compete with Clive Wilson all that." He said, "You can't do that. Just do what you do, you idiot. <laughs> do what you do. Yeah, that's what he brought you for." I think people can forget what they're good at though as well because they're looking at everyone else and what they're good at. No, I never, I never did, after, never did after that. Really? Okay. Never did after that and, and that, that was me set then. I was a piano carrier. I would carry it, put it down and then Ray could sit down and play it. Mm. You know what I mean? So without the piano there, he couldn't play it, could he? Yeah, absolutely. So it was a balance and, it, and it's about knowing yourself but it's also growing into it and, and Ray helped with some of the things he said. Well, so are you talking about Jerry Francis as a, as a leader? And look, we'll t oh, I want to find out more about your feelings on leadership. Mm. But I thought you always speak about Ray Wilkins very highly. And he was a massive hero of, of mine. Um, mm. oh, such a good pastor of the football. But also just generally had this sort of, well, from the outside, had this kind of like calm charisma. How would you describe his, his leadership? Because he's different to you, but I think there's a lot of bits that are the same as well. I think... I think he's a very unique human being. And what he lived through at being at the top since he was 18, 
being Chelsea captain. They made him captain with all that wonderful team around him. It really takes something a bit special to, to deal with it. Whether he dealt with it internally, we all now look back and think, is that what didn't help him? You know, and, and it's horrible to, to see that there was almost a, a side that he buried that he needed to help him, you know, and, and this is the worrying thing for me for f f football in the future is if someone like Ray needed a drink, you know, because you'd have never known that. Mm. He, he was an immense, he was an immense person, immense player. He dealt with things brilliantly in his mind. And he would always say to you, you've got more time than you think. you got more time than you think. Calm down, you can do this. You've got more, well done, you can do this. And he would say things to me like, oh, brilliant, you'll make me play another three years. Thank you. And he was just so genuine. But yeah. he said, it's not rocket science. You can do this. You just have to believe you can. Right? And he, and he helped me realign some of my sights because my sights were like, oh, I'm not going to give it away. No, no, never be caught with it. And right. I said, I don't get it. He went, well, if you're, no, if you know what you're going to do with it before it comes, that you're thinking the right way, son. Mm. So don't receive it. Have a look. You'll take too long. Have a look before the ball comes and then you can do all of this. He said, you can do this. Yeah. Because your techniques are good enough. You just need to think quicker. And that's how you do it. Before you call for it, mirror signal maneuver. Before you call for it, Look at, check the maneuver, yes, boom, bang, and you can do it one touch. Wow. And then all your skill set will be brilliant in this level. Because you'll pop it, pop it, pop it. If you can play a quick early pass, you can do this, you can do this, and you'll give it to Les, and you'll give it to him, and you'll give it to Andy Impey, and he'll beat people, and you'll look the nuts. And he'd only passed it five yards. Do you think he had, he had that skill of being quite attuned into seeing what someone else needs? How did he understand that? This is what I'm saying to you. Some of these great, great, great players find it easy. They don't have any empathy with anyone else who can't do it like them. But Ray didn't have that. Ray made us all believe we could do it. You ask Les Ferdinand, you ask Andy Sinton, you ask any one of us how we looked at him and how genuine he was. It was absolutely amazing. Any one of us would have died to help him if yeah. we knew he was in trouble, but we didn't know. You know, and that's that's the crying chain. Mm. You know, but I think I can't speak highly enough of the man himself, yeah. and and it ain't just me who says this. Every single human being he ever met yeah. will tell you how he cared about him and how he had empathy for him. I think you, know? you know, you saw that when he when he passed away, that everyone was firstly shocked by it. I remember, you know, putting talk sport on and just you know, just another person coming on and talking about how incredible he was and another person. <coughs> and I think, uh, you know, this, this series, I've spoken to different people and, and often the, the thing I, I quite like, I quite like just like highlighting is that we're, mm. we're all struggling. Yeah. I, I, and blokes in particular, we're all trying to figure it out at, at mm. different stages of your life. And for, for Ray, and I think for a lot of footballers, it can be, of course it's like, it's got to be so scary when you're, you're, you know, you're told where to be and what to do mm. and you're surrounded by a group of people the, the same age and you can kind of, you've got all that going on yeah. and then it, it all stops. I think that's just one element of it. I think that mm. even heightens what any bloke goes through when they get 40 and beyond. Yeah. Because you don't just stop getting upset or worrying about things or, you don't, that doesn't just disappear. As a man, you've got to deal with you're getting worse physically, unless you've got something that keeps you going and you've got to find that new something, you know? I think it would be wrong of me now to, to not stress how important your partner is as you go through life if you've got one. Yeah. Jackie Wilkins, unbelievable person. Mm. She saw the real Ray. She had to deal with the real Ray. Mm. Whereas we all saw the Ray Wilkins razor that we know, she dealt with the real one. Yeah. And her son, Ross, on the day of the funeral, it was amazing, man, what he said and how he said it about how strong his mum was yeah. and what football should have done to help dad. Now, you know, really deep down, we ought to be putting things in place to make sure that young footballers don't deal with this. Yeah. You know, Merce broke down again the other day. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah. We need to help these people. We need to make sure 
that this doesn't happen long term in the future. We re there's more than enough money to to make sure that these things are sorted out. I mean, Georgie Best, for God's sake, look at it all. We how many more are we going to let go this way? And it is psychologically yeah. dealing with this. And it doesn't know? discriminate. And I think I just think it's heightened in that world that you're in because it's. It must be, it's so up and down as well, right, emotionally. I think, going back to what you're saying about so, uh, Jackie Wilkins and, and your partner, like, I'm, as, I, I married my wife uh, a year and a half ago, and um, even in the last year, I kind of, the solace of having her, yeah. and she knows the real you, yeah. is... Yeah, but don't you feel sorry incredible. for a bit, because... A little bit, yeah. Little bit. She gets the More real... Sorry. The real... My wife Kim gets the real me, and, and it ain't nice sometimes, you know. But that's the panic side of it. You come out and you don't show it, you know. Yeah. But, but the strength of those relationships are so important, aren't absolutely, they? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the reality of those, you can actually impart onto other people if you want them to, to be the right way. So it's all about your level and your standards. And I yeah. think in, in life, loads of things dovetail. And I could talk to a bus driver, I could talk to someone who works in a shop. And I could talk to a footballer and really they all have the same issues and same problems and same beliefs or non-beliefs and it's dealing with those. Yeah. Can you turn a something you don't believe in that you can then do that makes you even stronger. So, you know, never say never. Even in history, we've needed people to be able to who can narrate and um, say it in a way that we all believe. Yeah. And those people have ended up unbelievably famous. We write clips of what they've said and quotations of what they said to inspire us all, but that's, there's that in all of us. We have to deal with that on a daily basis. Speaking of dovetailing, do you, uh, what things, and it can be vice versa, it can be either way, mm. what do you, have you taken from football and your, I was trying to work it out, I think it's 38 years. It's probably more than that, it's probably like 40 odd years, sorry. <laughs> you look great though. <laughs> Struggling. In the game. What have you taken from football, football management, being a player, that you've taken into your family life and what have you taken from your family life that you've put into your management? That's a good, I, I am what I am and I am, there's no full side of me. I can, and Do you enjoy I, that? I've said that to Ray before, you know, you know, he said to me, what if you lose that job and what, uh, who will you be then? I said, I'm still me, mate. Ray said, Ray, Ray said Wilkins that said that to me, yeah. And there's maybe a little insight into the, you know. Yeah, the, I said, I'm still work. me, mate. I've got other things that I, I like and I enjoy, I've always had that, make sure. And, and you know, even with my family life, having to learn sign language was not an easy thing to do, but it, you have to commit to it. So, you know, it is what it is, isn't it? You know, but what I found difficult, and I must be honest, that my hobby, the thing that I love, has ended up as work. And that makes it not quite so nice. Sometimes it's lucky if it's going well, you're all oh, great. Yeah. And then if it ain't going well, what have you got to fall back on then? Yeah. That was the biggest thing, you know? And, and then sometimes the more you know about it, the more you see it, the glamour goes and you see a big pile of scheiser, right? Because a lot you of it, too much, a lot of it is a scheiser. It's not what you want mm. being a manager. What comes across your desk 95% of the time is not what you really want to deal with. It's not that some of your lads have been out at a club and they've done this and done that. It's not that, that oh, hang on, that, that deal didn't go through, that, oh, we haven't paid this bloke. Or, do you know what I mean? It ain't about that. It's about the joy of the match, you know? And all day long, give me the match. Give me the chance to say something before the game, say something at halftime and then deal with the aftermath. What's the worst bit of football management? What's the, what's the show um, that you're talking about there? I think it's the bit that you can never, ever, ever truly be free of it. I'll give you an example. You know, you, you're constantly thinking about, because you observe training to see, you look at in depth so much so now who you're playing against, what they do, what their strengths are, their passing patterns, what can you do about that? Can you play your own game and hurt them? Or have you got to do a little bit, 15, 20% to stop them and then do your 80% little from that, you know? And Because not there's not many like Guardiola, just 100% of what we do will be good enough. That'll be ideal. Yeah. But so when that's happening, 
to be at home and sat down and having a meal with your wife who deserves your attention and then yeah. you're still thinking about your centre forward who looked a bit dodgy today and she said something and you can't remember what she said. That's the worst thing. And, and, she and then can, she, she catches you. Too. She, she catches tell. you and you go, ah, uh, oh, sorry, no. Yeah. It mm-hmm. ain't right, is it? No. Do you know what I mean? But It's tough. It's no, tough but to it is. Off, you're dealing it? with it and they've got to understand, she's got to understand because at the end of the day, you know, you're trying to provide, aren't you? Mm. But really, the secret to having everything is realising you've already got it. That's the truth. What do you mean? There ain't anything more that you would need today by the time you get home that you haven't already had and facilitated yourself because you'll have a perfect day, hopefully. You come down to meet me, you'll have a safe journey back. What I'm saying, what more that the driving force in you will be what else you want because you ain't got enough and it ain't good enough and, and it's all the other side of your mind because deep down, you've, that's it, you've right, got everything. Right. Yeah, yeah. You already got it. You know, so, and I'm not saying take your drive away, I'm not saying that, I'm saying appreciate. What am I grateful for today? Every morning you get up, what am I grateful for? What can I take responsibility for? Mm. Am I living in the right habits? Because I believe successful people, right, every one of them's got the same habits. Is that something they you try and work on? They don't make excuses. Oh, I would have done that, but come on, that stopped me. They, they don't make that. Same things happen to them, they just overcome them. You know, and, and it's about trying to train yourself. And if, what are they like when something goes wrong? Mm. Do they blame everybody else or do they take the responsibility, learn from it and move on? You know, so like, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful life. And I think I've only got one, but I want to make sure I have a full one. Yeah. I don't want a long one. It's a big difference. I don't want to struggle in the last few years where I end up with everybody else looking after me because I've lost me. I want a full life of being with it and at it and on it. And whatever that does, wherever it goes, I can't wait. It sounds like Do you're you know quite good mean? at letting things go then. Is that true? No. No? No, I, I used anger for years, but anger is not a good one. Determination is great, but anger is not good. Did, very angry sometimes. Did you get caught between the two? With myself. Two? I because thought of, anger was a friend of mine, made a little bloke like me. I get angry and, I, and, the, and the, well, I need anger. I don't need anger at all. Anger is horrible. I need determination. It's totally different. Can you give me an example of that? Because <sighs> I think determination, that's you as a player, isn't it? I'll, get, I'll, give, you, I'll give you some. Someone told me a price for something that I needed to have. <laughs> piece of land outside the front of my, and they told me a price, and I got angry about it. I didn't know, I just got angry. And what I then said to someone almost ruined the deal. You don't need anger. Right. Do you understand? Yeah, you yeah. don't need to get angry. You don't need to take everything personally. You don't need anger. You need to think and stop and control your emotions sometimes. But as a kid growing up, my how I was, I was the last of three. I used to feel things weren't fair. And then dad said, well, if you don't think it's fair, say something about it, do something about it, do it then. And I found I was doing it in an angry way, you know? But really, life's never gonna be fair, it's how you deal with things. I'd much rather be Bjorn Borg than McEnroe. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? But I was more like McEnroe. Were there people in the game that allowed you to realize that, or did you just No, this is, this is through management, because when, when you see someone else who might have the same traits as you, and and, you then can't get angry and show him what bad role model you are, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You can't go and say to him, well, don't get angry, and then 10 minutes later, you get angry yourself. Being oh. controlled, I believe, is, is a better way. You yeah. know, now I've got grandchildren. That's a better way. In life, you work from the unknown to the known. Ian Wright would have not known whether he can do it when he came off the park, but now he knows he did, mm. right? And I'm really proud of how he did it, but he won't be able to tell you them but now he's lived them, he'll be a great bloke to actually get these things off. You see him on the telly, what he talks about, how he talks, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, that's a really good point, that sort of, you're living in the unknown and you're moving into the You're trying unknown. to move towards it. You've got to be you know? brave enough to walk into it though, haven't you? One of the other processes, uh, videos we did with uh, two guys called Zach and Jay, one of them was talking about lean towards action. Yeah. So for example, yeah. we were supposed to do this on Thursday mm. and and you weren't able to, to do it. And so I was looking at other dates and I thought, before I'd spoken to him about mm. that and, and taken that in, knowing me, 
not trying to, I wouldn't ever want to bother you. Weirdly, I would have gone, oh, let's do it in two weeks because that feels safe over there. Mm. But I, because I had that ringing in my ear, I thought, well, now I can do it Tuesday. We yeah, can do it yeah. Tuesday. And now I'm here. And yeah. so you're always, the thing he says is you're always sort of net up if you go and do it. Yeah. Whatever it is. Like yeah, but not everybody's, not everybody's built that way. Some people are shy. Some people can't go into the arena. But life's about overcoming that. If you want to do it, do something, whatever it is. We, I believe we all have a, the ability to shine. Every one of us has the ability to shine. I don't know if you've seen um, Coach Carter. Wonderful, wonderful film. It's a true story yeah, yeah. about a basketball coach who really got to young kids and made them better because mm. he cared about them, you know? And I think it's a one of, and I believe in that so totally because it's finding that way to get it out of someone else. You know, when my kids, they were deaf and we couldn't get to them. Then someone said they're deaf and used sign language. Oh, opened up a door. It was amazing. You know, and now my youngest, who's had sign language all her life, she's got nine GCSEs, whereas my other two got none. It proved, you know, if, if you're deaf, then use a visual language, if you know they can see, and then English will come along after. And right. we didn't have any of this told to us when our kids were pronounced deaf. Mm. No one, no one actually went out on a limb and said, this is the way you do it. How frustrating was that? It's, it's frightening for, for families now who've, who've just faced this, their little child is deaf, what do they do? They're still getting this advice from everywhere. It depends where you are, what county you're in. It's just horrendous. Mm. Teach them sign language, have a base language, and then they'll learn. Once you've got one, that's easy. It's honestly, it's just wow. like frightening, you know, but you have to find your way, don't you? Yeah. That was the most terrifying thing in my life. Not any football match, not any getting the sack, you're getting sacked tomorrow, that's nothing about that. How are you going to educate these kids that you've got that need sign language? What does sign language mean? How do you learn that? I don't even know the language and my daughter's waiting for me to tell her something. How frightening is that? I can't, yeah, I can't imagine. It's so, a, everything else. moment, are you... What you're just lost, right? And and then what, after that, it's like right. Take a second and search for the answers. Is that what you? How did you? Uh, just I take action. Just take action. It's just the same thing. It. It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But you have to try and educate yourself into it, and and then go with your gut feeling. What do you want them to be? When are they happy? When does it work? How are you getting to them? And sign language. Open the door. They all use it in different ways. Yeah. All three of my children who are deaf, they use sign language in different ways, right? So one of them's totally deaf she's deaf that's it i'm deaf she's in a deaf order what color is your car you can't say that to her car color what yours you've got to put the object first like french bang car color what whereas i could say for 10 minutes you know that new car you got you know what color is it and you would be linked in well you've got to link them in so she needs that right my other one does sign supported english so I can talk about her car, what colour is your car. She'd understand it, because i got to put the word, right? And the youngest, any way you like, mm. don't bother her. Right, because you have BSL, British Sign Language, right? You have English, and then you have sign supported English. Three different aspects that they need to learn if they're going to be deaf in this world. Right. Right, so wow, right? But we didn't know that then. Yeah. And I was still trying to play for QPR and Bristol Rovers, and, yeah. you know, and my wife was trying to bring them up and, and then my boy had to deal with the fact that he's got three deaf daughters and he ain't deaf. Yeah. You know, and everything we had to do was to, yeah, whoa, is it, but isn't it marvellous? It, life's wonderful. So, you know, when it, when it comes to football things, could, to, that, that's, how lucky am I? It could be a perspective. Even now, I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed the year before this. Um, back at QPR, I thought I'd, probably had one of the best seasons I've ever had through dismantling the company that won't run, won't run correctly financially and putting it back and not getting relegated this time. You did everything you were asked. Yeah, and, and I felt I did it probably better than I'd even thought I could with the help that we had. We were in a real good situation. I'm glad QPR are in that situation now because that was what you're supposed to do. You know, if you go back to the other time, it, that wasn't as easy. Mm. I read a quote you were saying that um, you're having your your deaf daughters and having that connection with them and that trust with them. It's to, you said it totally enhances my life and it's made me a better person. 
What, did, what did, exactly did you mean? Well, you get more empathy with someone who's lost a, a sense, what it means. It sometimes makes me cry with Stevie Wonder. I've got Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder over there, and you listen to what they do, and you close your eyes for one second, and I'm sorry, you get it even more. Because they are so into what they're doing, yeah. it didn't stop them, did it? But their other sense is so heightened that makes them brilliant at that, you know? So whatever, whatever is taken away from you, I believe something else is added mm. if you're bright enough to see it. Yeah. You know, and and years ago we 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 took we didn't we don't have many holidays, but we saved up to go on a uh, a really nice one with all our kids when they were young and and it was in the Maldives and the stars looked like you could just touch them. It was absolutely beautiful and um my wife was there, we were walking along with one of our daughters and my wife looked at him and you could hear the sea coming in and out. And it was beautiful, you know? And when they were little, like, it gets you because they won't, of what they won't hear, yeah. that you can. And my wife said it to her, you know? She said, why, why you look sad, mum? She went, oh, you can't hear the, the waves rolling in, it's so beautiful. And she went, well, can you see the, the diamonds, the diamonds dancing on the water, on the water? And when you looked, it was just the, the light reflecting down, right. but it looked just like diamonds. Mm. But, but she wasn't concentrating on that because she, there were other things that she was There was other joys that in. she was seeing that we were missing. Wow. Do you get what I mean? That's so amazing. it's not what you haven't got, it's what you have got. And then the people that I've met through my daughters being deaf is amazing. The places we've been, the things we've done, the life, lives that you've touched, you know, and how it... No matter how small a touch it is, you hope that makes a difference. That's incredible. In terms of developing players, when you step into a, a new job, be it Plymouth or QPR in a situation they were in both times, Blackpool, that first week as a manager, what is, what is your process? What are you trying to achieve in, in that first week? If it is just about that group of players, what, what would you, how would you go into that, that first week as a manager? Well... You're trying to establish a, a set of laws or rules that you abide by and you want them to, right? So you, you can't tell them what those rules are. I try and get them involved into owning those rules so they're part of it. So there's no excuses there. What were those rules then? Well, quite simply, I'd just get a big sheet of paper and I'd ask them to think of one word that's important to them in their life and that they want to bring to this contract. I know you've signed a different contract, that was with someone else. This is my contract, right? So I want you to put a word on there. I put punctuality, right? So that means, you know what that means? So we explain the word and what it means. So, yeah. you know, um, and then we all, we would all sign it. It's a declaration of what we're going to bring. So when anyone's late, if punctuality is on there, I could say, well, you've seen, you seen the rules, haven't you? Broken, mate. You signed that, didn't you? Do you agree with that or not? So why have I got to be the one to tell you you're late? Dude? Just get lost. Pay the fine, do whatever it is, don't do it again, and I won't pick. And they knew I won't pick them. Yeah. So I had to try and establish those. Now every group's different. And so you wouldn't pick players based on those things. Oh no, I, if you're quite quick to do that, just to make the point. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. This is about what you're going to bring to us. Mm. You know, this is a privilege. Playing for this club's an absolute privilege. How dare you? How dare you? What did he do in that film? He chucked him out of the gym. Mm. He locked him out of the gym. Right, and if you argued, you had to do the runs, the suicides, and in the end, the lads did their that one kid suicides because he saw him trying to do them. That's what life's about, you know. So what I try and do is establish what I'm about. Hopefully, they'll be on the same page as me, and then hopefully we can be on the start of the journey. Because once it once the train gets going, that's it. Yeah. It's hard to jump on then, isn't it? And, and what you... I, what I want to do is I'm having, I'm starting with you lot, and I want you on board. So, you know, you want to get off. That's going to be tough because we're starting this journey. And I guess a good thing for you is that on that journey, the ones you jump on first, they're probably the characters that you, you want, right? Well, you've got to be careful which clubs you go to because I did that at Leicester, didn't work. I couldn't get that group right, you know, but it doesn't, this is what I'm trying to say yeah. to you in my life, it hasn't always worked because right. how I've done it, how I've said it, hasn't always worked with certain people in certain things. So, you know, at Blackpool it worked, it worked to treat. I was fortunate to get the job in the first place. I was fortunate to have the group that we had. 
by being who I was, I talked to the bloke upstairs, he put some money over, he wanted to do it. The Oysters didn't, but he did it. Mm. And luckily those players worked well for us, but you know, in the end, it, it was the group, it was everything that the group did, Yeah. you know, and, and being part of that, so. Because you also, I guess, m- most times you step into a, a new club, generally in the middle of a season, and uh, they're not doing well, the confidence is low. So what, what do you think these, what do, you, what do you generally think players need when you step into that situation? I mean, it's quite well documented now that a lot of footballers, you know, with Mourinho's style and what he said and how he, how he, how he did these presentations about the four phases of the game, right? You, so you've got your attacking shape, you've got your transition to defending, you've got your defensive shape, and then you've got your transitions to attack. So there's... It's all interwoven. Mm-hmm. So when he does his speak talks and all of that, and and the more the more educated we get, the more foreign coaches we get, we understand what's happening all around the world. So you can talk about this, you know. But what you try and do, you got you got to basically put down the moral code of your club. What I want you to do, and strip that away from tactics because your tactics might change, but your way you behave doesn't. Principles of play. Right. There's a threat there, right? The principles of play for us and this club are this, this, this. You get there within four seconds. You get as tight as you can. You make them play square or backwards, end on. Every time, no matter what the tactics are, every time, unless I tell you different. Do you understand? Mm. Yes. What does he need when he's on his way? Someone else to talk to him. So we talk to the one who's pressing, right? Do you understand? If it's not you, then you should be talking, and as he goes, you should be working with him. Do you understand? Yeah. Why don't you do it then? Why aren't we practicing this? So we bring it into practice, so you understand. Principles of play, absolutely nail them down. Right, this week's tactics are this. So you've got the group then. You can't go into a war and every battle be the same. It's impossible. So what I'm saying, but your behavior needs to be the same. Right. You drop and cover, you, you move and you cover, you move and you cover, because without the cover, you can't move. Mm. You get shot, you get killed. So this is what we're talking about, right. you know? And it's extreme ownership, right? End of, you have to own what you do. And it all goes back to Jerry Francis years ago. Always three mistakes for every goal, not just your fault, son. What are you doing? What are you doing? And, and in the end, there was five or six, because right. we were all like holding our hands up. We <laughs> wanted to learn. Yeah. At first, you didn't want to be picked out, but in the end, you wanted to learn. Often, I think, in terms of management in any, in any world, the kind of the distance between you and the people that you're managing, mm. that's, that's something you've got to tread as well. So that's why I was asking that question, because I, I wonder when you're going into a new group as someone who's, who's very personable, yeah. that might have been something, I'm, guess, I'm totally guessing, that you might have had to learn along the way of, like, you might want to go in and go, Mm. It's okay, like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But actually, you've probably got to keep a certain amount of distance to not. I just think that's a whole that's a whole mess that's got to be quite difficult to deal with. It sounds like yeah. the thing that you're you would put in place in that first week is what are the things that every single person here can control. Yeah. Be it that. Yeah, but it didn't always work. My so, rule, my rules haven't always worked with the, the groups that I've been with because I was. So what so happened at Leicester? Because I remember, I remember thinking. You did great with us. I gutted that you left. Yeah. And then we went to Plymouth and I remember thinking, look what he's fucking doing at Plymouth. Mm. We're pissing about here. Mm. Because you did the same thing there. You, got that, you could see how happy that group <coughs> of players were playing for you. Yeah, but I wasn't happy with the board because they changed what they said to me. And if you yeah. do that with me, then I'm, I, I can't deal with you. Right. I, I just, you can't move the goalposts. But, from, sorry, so, but for someone outside of it, I was looking at... He's yeah, done, I should have never left there. He's done the magic, he's done the magic, he's done the magic at Plymouth. But I, I understood, and then when you went to Leicester, I understood it. No, 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 I st- yeah, but when I went to Leicester, I didn't understand the mess a club could be in. Right. Right? I Different kind of mess. I oh, it's that. unbelievable. They had 50, 60 players on a lot more money than anybody I've ever managed before in my life. And the goalie came and stood me there and said, I'm not going out on loan gaffer. I want him to pay me every single penny that he gave me. He gave me that contract. And I'm going to take every penny. I'm not going to cause you a problem, but I, I, I'm not going to go to anyone else and play. I don't need to. He said, I want to retire. They gave me this contract and I'm going to take the money. So I had however many people there want to take 
Mandrix's money. Right. That thirty six year old centre half who I was told to play Bruno and got he didn't even care anymore. Didn't want to play anymore. Really? So I had him there and I was being told you ought to pick him because, oh, all right, Milan, yeah, okay, brilliant. So why don't you do it yourself? So I was trying to be strong for him and it, <coughs> it all went wrong because the ego in me then was wrong. My ego was wrong. I was doing it for the wrong reasons. At Plymouth, I wasn't. I wanted to take, they said they would take the thing forward and I didn't believe they were, mm. right? When I turned down 1.5 million pound for a, for a player and they didn't double his money because he was only on two grand a week then, right? And we just turned down a lot of money for him and he'd have gone to Stoke, right? So I, I've always told people, I'll help you get better. If I can't do that, you'll have to leave. Yeah. So really I would have sold him if they weren't gonna reward him. So they argued with me, how's that gonna fit in the dressing room? I said, I don't care about the other. Any one of them comes on my door, knocks on it. Gaffer, I want the same as him. We'll get one point million pound offered for you. I'll turn it down and then I'll give you the same as him. If not, get out and shut up. Because he was my best player. Mm. And my best player went on the best money. So with all these inflated egos in terms of the playing staff at, at Leicester, when you stepped into that, did you just, was there an element, was it difficult to get did you struggle to have the power over those? No, it was people? impossible. I was undermined every minute of the day because new players were coming along all the time. The chairman would be coming down and some of the staff would go and speak to him and, you know, it, it, it was, like, ridiculous. But that's life. You didn't know You didn't know all those things. You, I, if I'd have asked someone... Yeah. But I didn't want my life to pass me by without having the opportunity to have a 33,000 crowd and money to spend and hopefully Milan Mandric, you And it didn't work, yeah. so... Well, that's, you know, what, that's what I was saying. I, I got it. Like, I, it was the next step. Yeah, but I only perfect. lasted four, five months, six months, yeah. and that ain't long enough. No. And I'd have much, been much better to swallow my ego and say, all right, you ain't going to do those things. Okay, I'll keep going. Yeah. Right? And what happened at Blackpool, I think, might have happened down there at that time. That squad we had was almost good enough, in my opinion. So you went, once that ended... You've said that you kind of you had to go away and figure out what you'd got wrong. What did yeah. you figure out? Well, it's me, isn't it? It's, Why, my, it's if, my ego. It's right. the twistedness of it. It's it's where I was going in my head, and you know. What do you mean when you say ego? How, how I handled. I, want, I wanted two of my staff to get better deals because they weren't on enough money. How, how well we were going. I wanted a, I want, and I wanted it all done like that. And I said it in a board meeting. The next thing, two of the board were gone because they wanted to do it and the other four didn't and they got rid of them too. So then we were back to, oh, wait a minute. You know, the old, and they said they would take it forward all the time in my first interview. Mm. I said, I don't want another QPR here. I don't want to, you know, oh no, we're going to keep moving forward because they had good promotions, didn't they? With so Sturrock and they lost, they, yeah. We <coughs> and they lost Sturrock and he went to yeah. Southampton. So I said, look, please, all I want is to progress and think bigger and, you know, so I thought that was happening and when it wasn't, I could have handled it in a much better way because the loyalty the fans had for me, I betrayed. They didn't know about the board. They didn't know what about it. It was none of their business. I should have just stayed till the end of the season and then got another job. Right. If that's okay, what yeah. I wanted. Right? So I'm going to say, it's difficult to, you've also got to be ambitious, haven't you? When you say betray, you, you kind of answered it there by saying, look, stay till the end of the season, then make a decision then. But you're allowed to be ambitious. Yeah, but what you do, you end up thinking, oh, that job might not come out that way, I might not get that ass back, I might not... Yeah. But in about that, is it? It's about the job you're doing right now, what that means. And I was doing it that well, it meant that much. Mm. Those fans don't believe me, because I upped and went, right? And really, I should have stayed. Right. And it wasn't because of what happened after I'm saying, as a person, who I want to be, I should have stayed. Right. right? That group deserved me to stay. The group of people I had there then, Lillian, Nallis, Wooten, all the lads I brought there, you know? I should have stayed. Mm. You know? I did a personal thing. Right? And life then went, there you go, deal with that, there you go, have that. Right. So I'm guessing, you know, that failure, you took that into, into the Blackpool job. <coughs> no, what? I took it into how bad I felt and rethinking every single thing I'd ever done mm. and adding a forward thinking plan to what I was doing. 
because most of the things I did was a defensive plan. I had, I developed every which way of defensive shape, attacking shape, because most of the time I concentrated on being 4-4-2 and being solid and making yeah. sure that poor old Gareth Ainsworth had to come in and, you know, I spent most of my life coaching him about tucking round and getting back on shape without the ball, mm. when all he wanted to do was go and play with the ball. So much so that when I left and Gary Wallop came in, he went, oh, is, is Gareth's comments were, oh, he's encouraging us flair players. You know, where mm. I encouraged him like you wouldn't believe, but I also coached him on how to be without the ball. Yeah. Whereas really, that should have been a tiny bit <coughs> of focus. And then off you go. Go and do that. Let's hit Gareth. Let's play to his strength. That's what I should have done. It sounded like you got to a conclusion where you were, this is the wrong phrase, but you were like, fuck it a little bit when it got to Blackpool in terms of... No, no, you I was, only no, 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 it wasn't that. I was scared to lose and I realised I was coaching in a way about being scared to lose rather than believing you could win. Yeah. That's, right? what, that's the kind no, of what that's, I mean. Yeah, not fuck it. it was, I believe I can win if I yeah. do this. As in like, fuck it, let's have a go at these lot. Because why not? Because it sounds like, Blackpool, mm. you, you scored a hell of a lot of goals, you played incredible football, but you conceded a lot of goals as well. But if you don't, if you don't go for it, like yeah. you did, and have a freedom to do that, then they wouldn't have achieved what you achieved, surely? No, no. It, it was having both sides of the plan. You need both sides of the plan, defensively and attack-mindedly, and then you fill in with the transitions. And if you have an aggressive transition in their half, you can force a lot of mistakes. That's what's happening now. The game's being squashed into your half only. But it, it was the way that that team played, in terms of like the obvious names that you could have in any league, yeah. those, that team, you played such attacking football. That's yeah, really, yeah that's, that's a lot more attacking than any other team in yeah, that league. Yeah, four three three. I changed the the four three three, which is, you know, how, how the models go in now. Mm. But I watched. It took me a year to look at the good teams that were doing it. Swansea, I watched Man United four or five times. You know, luckily enough for the BBC, they were asking me to go and watch these games. Mm. And then I went to Spain and just took a little diary with me and wrote down what is it with these lot? <laughs> is it the weather? Right? What constitutes the Barcelona playing like Barcelona? How can Spain be as good as they are? What is it? Is it the nature of the people there? You know, they, they, they taunt the ball, don't they? Ole, ole, they, don't, they just lure him in, don't they? They don't want to just beat you, they want to humiliate you. So I, I asked all these questions, I went over and I watched, and I watched what they did, and I thought they had fantastic practices that were positive and that were attacking. And I realised that you can defend by attacking well. You can squeeze people back by attacking well. Mm. And then you don't have to defend so much. You know? And I believe that that is... England look like Man City at the moment. If you look at them last night. Yeah. Because we're learning to attack that much better with our wide men doing what they're doing and the structure. So, you know, it, I took a year to develop a plan. Everybody who had it, wherever they were in... I knew where I wanted everybody else to be. Right. And I got one or two things wrong in reality that ended up getting us relegated at Blackpool. Um, and then at Palace, I didn't last long enough to be able to impart what I wanted to do onto that new group that we just built. Because Steve and I fell out a little bit. That was a very unique way of leaving a, a club. You don't normally see that. You see the manager hanging in there and hanging in there and you don't know if he believes in himself or if he's a bit lost or whatever and then it gets to a point and then, you know, he's gone. You sort of took the decision. Did you take the decision yourself at, 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 at No, we were having discussions about... That was a, a real tough period because I had no chief, chief scout. Um, so we we got promoted through the playoffs mm. um, and then we had all these players who... I didn't know anything about and I had no chief scout who would have seen him and you know I had names from the last one who, who Dougie Freeman took with him to Bolton. Yeah. Um, my fellow who I normally work with Gary Penrose was working for Stoke mm -hmm. and I had Steve Parrish giving me name after name after name after name do we want to sign him do we want to sign him so I had to watch Y Scout all summer 
till nearly 12, well, it was almost 12 o'clock, 11, half past 11 every single night, cross him off or say, yeah, and all, bear in mind, you're only watching like the best clips of him. Yeah. So, you know, I kept saying no, 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 no. He was getting frustrated. I said, I don't care. I'd rather go with who we've got. No, 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 he ain't bad. No, 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 he's all right. And in the end, I just finished. Um, and there was a clause in my contract that instead of having nailed down, I shook hands on. If I get you up, I don't want that to be the payoff and for you to get rid of me, I want it readjusted. And he went, okay, but I didn't have it in writing. And he refused to change it in the summer. So when somebody up there does that to me, and it was my fault, as he quite rightly said, you should have had that agreed. I said, well, I thought you were a man of your word. He said, no, you're a bad businessman because you should have, I wouldn't have signed that. I said, well, I did and I trusted you. And now I'm not sure I can work with you. Right. Unless you change that, I'm not going to, why should I? Just get on with it. I couldn't just get on with it. Right. Because in that press conference, you, you didn't, obviously. Well, I wouldn't have got paid any money if I'd have said what I've just yeah, said yeah, now, yeah. but that was the fact, you know, and, and I work with people that I want to work with. And when somebody shows me that they're not who I want them to be, then I can't Struggle. really do it yeah. anymore. Because yeah. it has to be real. Mm. And I'm sure a lot of people feel like that about me. They think I'm this and I'm going to be that, and I'm not, you know, I am who I am, yeah. you know, but... That must be tough for a manager because you're, you're, you're in the middle, aren't you? You're like, you've got the players here, you've got the coaching staff around you, and then you've got the, the owner above you, and you're, you're, you kind of need everyone to be on board with you. If you're, you know, if you're a man of principle, and you're so turned off by something like that, which you, I, I totally commend you for, it, that's a, being the manager is such a, you're such a lightning rod for, for everything. And so it's, I just find it, I find it really confusing, that job. <laughs> no, no, the way, the way things are getting these days, it, yeah, it is very difficult because you are, you're the thin end of the wedge. You are in between this group of people who are more important than you now, which is the players, mm. all of them, mm. you know, because the media will say, wait a minute, Pogba's had a bit of a fallout with Mourinho. And if Mourinho's angry with the people above him, like, and he brings that to some meetings and the players hear that, then, whoa, there's only one way it's ever going to end, because you're being undermined. Yeah. So how easy is it for a manager to be undermined these days? It just feels really backward, doesn't it? Yeah, Arsenal fans were singing, we want you out to Arsene Wenger. I mean, come on, that ain't right, is it? And then the away fans were singing, we want you to stay. You know, I mean, to me, that's the biggest embarrassment I've ever seen of, of football fans, singing about a man who don't deserve that, in my no. opinion. Okay. I don't agree with that. I don't, you know, and all the Arsenal fans, they could say what they like. You know, I'm not sure Emery's ever going to be able to do what Arsene Wenger ever dreamed of doing, in my opinion. You've been spoilt for however many years. Yes, he might have stayed too long. Maybe he should have gone upstairs, but no one deserved that sort of pelters. I imagine nine managers out of ten in this situation, because you are, you're that guy who has to do the interviews and all those things, and you're the first guy who loses his job. How inf it must be so infuriating to be misunderstood, which you must get misunderstood a hell of a lot. Well, if I go back to Palace, I didn't get misunderstood. I said to Steve, I don't, you know, I, I'm not really happy with any of this. He said, well, it's your fault. And he's right. He was right. It was my fault. I agreed. Uh, totally minuscule payoff because I had that at, at Blackpool and I believed I, it was the right club for me to go to. I had a real good squad that I could I, and I didn't promise them I'd get promoted because you never, you should never do that. But I, you know, but they played a totally different way than I wanted to. It was all about counterattacking. Mm. It was set up to counterattack. And I said to Steve, right, if we're going to argue about this other thing, well, I want to play this other way. He went, yeah, but we got to make sure we win and we got to make sure we stay up. And I said, well, you didn't say that when I got the job. You want, you got fed up with the way you were playing. Mm. Oh yeah, but it's Premier League. We got to stay there. I said, well, Tony Pulis would be the best bloke because that's how he plays. And I said, I said, this squad is set up for Tony Pulis to deal with. I said, he's a great mate of mine. You get on fine. I said, so let's not fall out about it. I didn't, I never fell out with him. Right. I was worn out. You're worn out. I was worn out. There was a big thing I was trying to get over to these players. And all they wanted to do was not have the ball, drop back, 
get in their little zones and then counterattack. And it was really clever. It was really good. It taught me another way of playing, right? You know, and and they left their two white men. They were back, but they left them, and they left Murray up the middle. Yeah. And they said their back seven would just deal with it. As the cross comes in, edit to one of these boxes, and then they'll counterattack. And if it drops, find Glenn Murray, and then boom, off you go. So we had a ten, and we had two wide men, and they just went and attacked on their own, and they were good enough to do it. Mm. And it was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing, but it wasn't how I wanted. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because I wanted to play the way that I wanted to play. Yeah. So there's loads of ways to do things. It's about living the way that you want. And because I'd been semi-successful with getting promoted and got a, a, a bonus for getting there, I could actually say to Steve, "Yeah, I'm not sure I like this. You kind of earned the right to do that. You know, yeah. I didn't think it was going to end there. Mm. That's gospel truth. It could have gone either way that day on a flip of a coin. Steve made the decision. Some of the other directors wanted me to stay, but Steve made the decision, said what we were going to say, and I backed him. And that's why I looked totally shocked on the day because I didn't know that was happening. He spoke highly of you in that, you know, in that press conference. We spoke highly of each other because I respected Crystal Palace and how he felt about him, what he was trying to do with it, where it was going. And if that was the best for Crystal Palace, then that's what I agreed with. Mm. He was right about what I should have got. I should have dealt with that before I came. Mm. And he's right. I'm not a good businessman when it comes to myself. When it comes to everyone else, I can improve your business tenfold. We'll have a chat after. You know what I mean? Yeah. Seriously, yeah, because yeah. I know it's easy for me to talk about Charlie Adam, Stephen Craney, um, Keith Southern, Baptiste, anybody you like about how great they are. Mm for what they did for, you know, but when it comes to about yourself, I think there's no worse sound, do you? Someone blowing their own trumpet, it's absolutely horrendous. I, I struggle with that, because I, felt, I struggle with the thought of, um, yeah, how that comes, it just makes me cringe a bit, the, the thought of, of talking like that, but some people are really good at it. Some people are really good at sort of bullshit. The, the no, I think people are taught how to do it, and I think it's a big part of business world. If you go up to London, you see all of that, and you know, but in about what you got, it's about who you are that matters, really. Okay. That's how I feel. Uh, there's one question I ask everyone that I talk to. Um, what keeps you up at night? Not having anywhere to park outside the front of my house. <laughs> Just had a dispute with the with a, a farmer. I've asked you at the wrong time, haven't I? You yeah. have, yeah. A week later, I would have got to go. A, a no, when, when, when Kim had cancer, that kept me up. Because you're not in control of anything like that, are you? Mm. Not in control of that. Yeah. So, anybody who's had to had some hardships like that or have lost a child, I mean, I don't think I could cope with that. You know, I don't. I really don't think I could deal with that. I think that would be my worst terror. Mm. That you know, having to bury one of my own children. I don't. You know, and anybody who's had to do that, I I feel for you. But yeah. but really, one of one of my chairman, one of my earlier chairman, not too popular. He isn't really isn't very popular at all, but okay, I, can guess. I found parts of him quite um, remarkable, really, the way he saw things. Problems. Oh, problems, Ollie. You've got to embrace them. Because without him, without that challenge of solving a problem, what is there? He said so many, so many people just moan, oh, this is happening to me, but they're not embracing it. They're not seeing it and overcoming it and wow I just live for a next problem and how many people just get up on oh god I can't but whoa starting the wrong way ain't you that should you should get energy from this and come on how can I solve this you know so it's, it's amazing what you learn along the way but do I always do that no no I don't is it too much for me sometimes yeah it is yeah yeah I do you think that deep down that exactly what you just said there connects with you in a, a huge way that that like that underdog <laughs> Underdog, it's not, it's not giving no, you No, no, credit, you're right, because sometimes I have lost energy and I haven't achieved what I wanted to achieve because I didn't believe in it then. When I see how bad that was run mm. at Leicester, I didn't believe I could change it. Where I was with Steve Parrish, I didn't believe I could keep him up then, and I told him that. 
right? Which wasn't a clever thing to say because part of me, he lost when he didn't do what I wanted him to do. Mm. But I should have made him do that before I signed. But I, but you also that, salivated these. That's you salivated the problems. You salivated the let's fucking show them. You like that? I always have because I've never had any other problems. I, I, I am had the. Trait. We've, we've got to do this problem. You know, we're the favourites to do this. Mm. And there's no better feeling. There's no better feeling than than when you're in that situation. And I, another thing I love about you is, I think it was it was when we got promoted at Hillsborough. And there's, we've, so we've won 3-1, we've got promoted. <coughs> we come over and I couldn't wait to see you because I, I knew you'd be bouncing about. And got to you and there's a camera on you and you just scream. Mm. You just scream, it is, it's screaming out of you how incredible that feeling is of going, no one gave us a chance, we've done it anyway. Mm. And I think that is like, that's one of the best things in sport. And I think it's one of the best things that you, you have that a lot of people don't have that intangible. And I think you've seen that in some of the teams that you've managed. And so, so it's the final thing I kind of want to talk about was, was Blackpool one more time. Because I think I've got the word here, intangibles. Mm. So Plymouth, I think you had it for, uh, looking from afar. Mm. Um, QPR certainly had it the first year. Gareth Ainsworth has mm. the intangibles. Mark Bertram has the intangibles. Mm. Um, Danny Shitu in a different way as mm. those, you know. And then that Blackpool team, Brett Ormerod, mm. has the intangibles. Mm. Mm. That is one thing that, there's one thing that I still th- think, thank God we've got it in sport, thank God we've got it mm. in football, is the intangibles. Because you can't, and, and all these statisticians now, we see all these stats, they talk about it, but actually even those guys are saying, there's a lot of things that you just can't, you still can't put your, put your finger on. No, but I believe you can breed them. Mm, I agree. You don't. No one's born with them. They just get encouraged to get it out of them. But I you think know? I think you love the intangibles, right? I think I can't live without that because that's what I'm made of. I was made that way, you know, with my upbringing, with my mum, with my dad, and and all of it. Every single thing. I mean, it's hilarious. My mum's sense of humour was unbelievable. She lived 30, 31 years without my dad. She, he died when she, my mum was 54, my dad was only 59, and we lost her last, last year. So she lived till she was 80, 84, 85 without him. Oh. Never wanted to, ever had another date, not at all. That was enough. And they were like that, you know? And I can remember them telling me stories about you know, when I first met your mum, I had, I had my Navy suit on and she asked me, first thing she said to me was, are you in the Navy? And he said, yeah, are you a detective? <laughs> 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 Bloody obvious, isn't it? She went, you'll have to come out of there if you want to date me. And then she got off the train. So he had to lose his way of earning money if he wanted to date that <laughs> wow. lovely young lady. So anyway, he gets on the train another time and why did you say that? That's, oh, my dad's in the Navy and I don't want to be married to uh, somebody. He said, married? I was only going to ask you out for a drink. <laughs> Steady on. <laughs> <laughs> but this is it, isn't it? And do you know what I mean? I, I, this surrounded me in my whole life. And, and you've got to be proud of what you do. Don't worry about anyone else. Go through the front door, son. Right? They don't like you. They'll throw you back out. Right? And if you end up on your ass, get back up and be proud that you tried. Never go in a side door or back door, ever. Not ever. That ain't all the way. That ain't how we bring you up. You go straight in, say it how it is. And if you don't like something, if you don't think it's fair, don't be the one who don't say it. Never sit on your hands. Go and have a go. He said, because that's the ones who fail in life, because they fail to even try. Don't ever be like that. How can I do anything else? I wouldn't want you to do anything. No, like some of it I got wrong. Some of it I'm going to have to adjust, but I'm still doing it. I'm still going. And you've got to find new ways. I think that's the beautiful thing because football is fashion and it changes and it goes in and out. And you've got to... Bell bottoms are in this week. <laughs> hey, 
These skinny jeans got to go, mate. You can't, I can't Sorry. get them on. They got to go. Let's I've get, seen you wear them. Let's get the flares back. Let's get some boot cut. Let's get, what about them when I was a kid? You need them ones where you can fit your book in your, in your trouser leg pocket and you could already walk. And then them ones that like a table tennis bat, them shoes. I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? With a bit, oh, what is, yeah, but they call it fashion. They just get you to spend more money. That's all it is. Mm. You know, and, and really, you got to do what makes you happy. And for some reason, meeting new people and being around football people, supporters or players or other supporters makes me happy. So I can't see me not being involved somewhere or other. Ollie, uh, you've said it a few times. You are who you are. Can I mm. just say, never change. I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to, kid. I don't want to. Great to meet Great you. Great to meet you. Do you want another cup of tea? Yes, that's good. Yes, we have another cup of tea.